So I think that all the speakers have tried. Um, so maybe we can also start if you want, because we are perfectly in time. Yeah. Oh. So I can say something formal because the video is recorded. So I should say something like good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for, for being part of the 84 parallel session of the Master Grossman meeting is based on recent developments of the standard models of particles and cosmology. Um, so you know that this, this parallel session will take place in four days. Today, we are going to start with six talks. Um, the, the first one, the first talk is given by Peter Dasby. Uh, that is going to discuss about let me read the, the, the title, A Modern Independent Approach to the Study of f Cosmologies with Expansion and History is Close to Lambda CDM. Um, so I think that in one minute, Peter can start. We have 15 minutes each and five minutes for uh, questions in case you would like to discuss more things and have more time with the, the colleague that uh, speaks. You can have a breakout uh, room uh, for a pre discussion. I think we are perfectly in time and we can start with Peter Dasby from the University of Cape Town. Thank you, Peter, please. Thank you very much, uh, Orlando. It's great uh, to be here. Uh, very strange times, but uh, so it's nice to be part of this meeting. So today, what I want to report on are some recent results uh, uh, that we've uh, found in relation to a dynamical systems approach to FFR gravity, um, and in particular, um, looking at a situation where the expansion history um, is close to lambda. In fact, the expansion history is exactly the same as lambda CDM, but the cosmology is, uh, is, is overall close to lambda CDM when, when one includes the, the perturbations. So let me... Um, so, so <clears throat> the outline is, is roughly as follows. So I'll, I'll talk first, first about a range of uh, methods that have been used um, over the uh, last few years in relation to trying to reconstruct um, the theories of, of, of FFR gravity based on um, a pre-subscribed pre uh, expansion history. Uh, and these two methods are largely the reconstruction methods, very well known, and also maybe less, less well known dynamical systems methods, uh, which are somewhat more general for, for dealing with uh, such, uh, such situations. And then as, as I'll explain, the problem with uh, this approach is trying to close the dynamical system. Um, so I will propose a, a way of doing this using cosmography. Um, and then I'll use this to to discuss some constraints on exact F of R lambda CDM models um, and uh, mention some future work. So let's start with reconstruction methods. So this is something, something that's been widely used over the years to try and uh, reconstruct the, uh, the fundamental theory of, of gravity, the F of R theory of gravity based on a particular expansion history. So for example, uh, you could fix um, the scale factor in such a way that it exactly uh, describes a lambda CDM evolution. And from that, you can invert the, uh, the cosmological equations to obtain a differential equation for the theory and the underlying theory. You could integrate that equation and find a class of F of R theories of gravity that give you exactly that expansion history. Uh, it's not the only uh, reconstruction method that, that could be used. You could uh, equally well choose your um, function t of, of, of r, where r is the Ricci scalar. You could also fix the uh, cosmography by choosing the particular form for the deceleration parameter, for example, um, and then uh, obtain a similar differential equation for the underlying theory. So some examples of this um, work done by, uh, particularly by um, Sergei Odensov, 
Um, and then I've done some work with Santa Carloni and, uh, and Goswami on this problem. Um, the other approach, which is more powerful in my view, um, is, is that based on dynamic, dynamical systems. And uh, this has been inspired by uh, fairly old work uh, done by, by Wainwright and, um, uh, and then uh, used by Goliath and Ellis to describe Lambda CDM cosmologies. And then a book which was based on a, a workshop that took place in Cape Town many years ago, which uh, was edited by uh, Wainwright and Ellis. So the approach to FFR gravity is very much inspired by these methods. Uh, so just to give you an example, some background behind this. Um, so uh, in the case of Lambda CDM, what's nice is you can compactify this, the phase space. Uh, in a rather beautiful way. Um, and the, uh, the phase space can be split into two halves, one describing uh, expanding only models and then the other half uh, purely contracting models. The central point is, this, is the Einstein static uh, solution. And then one typically has evolutions from an expanding uh, Friedman's sort of background to, uh, to a late time accelerating the sitter solution. So this, is, this would be a typical Lambda CDM um, evolution in this context. Um, extending this to F of R gravity can be fairly straight, can, can be fairly easily done um, by uh, defining a, a set of additional dynamical variables beyond the standard density parameter and the parameter which describes the um, the Hubble rate or the expansion. And in this way, you can also uh, formulate a compact dynamical system and uh, derive a set of autonomous differential, differential equations, which describes the full dynamics of uh, any F of R theory of gravity. The problem with this setup, however, is that the system does not close. There's a closure condition that needs to be obeyed. Uh, so one sets, one fixes your theory of gravity, one, uh, the function f, and then one tries to invert to write down uh, the gamma function in terms of the set of dynamical systems variables. And this can only be done in, uh, in certain cases. Um, it can't be done in general. So for example, let me just uh, illustrate this with, uh, with a very simple example. So if you take the theory r plus alpha r to the n, um, in this case, you can close the system fairly easily. And you can see that you get a number of nice features. You get a transient matter-dominated Friedman solution, which is a saddle point. Um, and then you get a late time de Sitter attractor, just like you do in, in standard Lambda CDM cosmology. Of course, the, the intermediate dynamics will be very different from Lambda CDM, but you at least have this transient um, flat, uh, Friedman dominated phase or matter dominated phase followed by a late time, late time acceleration. So these, uh, these theories can fairly, fairly well describe the typical uh, expansion histories that one would want in a F of R dark energy model. Um, the, the issue though, as I mentioned, is this closure condition. And one way of trying to avoid this closure condition is by using cosmography. So you can, you can write the gamma parameter uh, directly in terms of the dynamical systems variables together with a term which, uh, which can be uh, pinned down by the choice of uh, cosmography. So basically the second derivative of the Hubble parameter. So if you write that in terms of the standard cosmogra cosmographic parameters, you see that gamma can be written directly in terms of the original dynamical systems variables together with the deceleration parameter, the jerk parameter. Um, and they, of course, then will be coupled with a full hierarchy of uh, cosmographic uh, terms. So this is nice. It's still not closed. But what one can do is one can then choose the, uh, the cosmography or choose the expansion history and then use that to close the system, the dynamical, uh, the, the autonomous uh, system of equations in a much more general way than simply fixing the theory of gravity 
and then try to describe the di dynamics within that theory and then a whole series of other theories that one might want to consider. So in this, in this, in this way, one can, one, one can describe whole classes of, uh, of F of R theories of gravity, which can be described by a, um, a particular expansion history. So these are general equations. They're not closed until you fix the particular cosmography. So the first thing that we did in this case was to take um, the lambda CDM uh, cosmology. Actually, before that, there are a couple of other issues that we, we need to sort of pin down. Um, the first is, um, you know, that you have a number of conditions which relate to various instabilities that might occur in these theories, in particular, the, uh, um, the Dolgoff uh, Kwasaki instability. Um, and what this does is it, it, it puts a constraint on the allowed physical region of phase space. Um, then you can, uh, you can fix your cosmography, close your, your dynamical system, identify the fixed points, and then for each fixed point, you could do a standard reconstruction method um, as I described before. And so um, in the case where we fix the expansion history to be the standard Lambda CDM cosmology, in that case, the jerk parameter is rather simple. So in the case where you, you uh, don't fix the spatial curvature, you consider a general spatial curvature, the jerk parameter is simply K plus one. This then closes the dynamical system and the spatially flat solutions are an invariant submanifold. So when K is zero, you get invariant sub submanifold. And then that itself can be split into two further invariant sub submanifolds, um, one which is purely accelerating and attractive. So that's the Q equal to minus one uh, case. And then the other, which is Q is a, a half, which is the decelerating or um, invariant submanifold, and that is repulsive. You'd expect this um, because you're typically evolving from a decelerating phase towards an accelerating phase. And then when X is zero, that, co that corresponds to the, the GR limit. So the, the surface X equal to zero will correspond to those solutions which are purely uh, GR, GR. So these are the, the general equations describing any F of R theory of gravity, which has an expansion history exactly the same as lambda CDM. So you can work out the fixed points, um, like in the case that the, the example I gave earlier, you ha again have a transient matter dominated epoch uh, with a scale factor which uh, which goes like t to the two thirds. The equation of state is uh, standard dust, standard cold up matter. And then your future attractor in this case um, is a De Sitter solution, but it lies in a region, and this is quite important, it lies in a region, region where the second derivative of the underlying theory F is negative. So it violates the uh, Dolk of uh, um, uh, Kawasaki uh, condition. So, so, so it lies in a region where you are likely to get instabilities in the future. Now this shouldn't concern us too much provided the, uh, the evolution of the model um, uh, is, you know, passes the transient matter dominated solution then start to accelerate um, so in a sort of pseudo dark energy phase. And then this instability could lie in the far future. So it's not a big concern. It, only, it would only be a concern if one enters that region at an earlier stage. Nevertheless, uh, as a general result for such cosmologies um, that exactly reproduce uh, an expansion history, the same expansion history as Lambda CDM, uh, in the far future, you will necessarily hit this instability. So this is the first result that we, we obtain uh, from our, our, our analysis. Um, so what we want to do then is go beyond that. So we've got an expansion history, which is the same as Lambda CDM. What we want to now consider are uh, deviations away from Lambda CDM uh, through looking at cosmological perturbations. 
and then look at those perturbations along orbits which characterize the, the evolution of, of, the, of the background. And so I'm going to focus on the sub-Hubble Hubble modes because they're going to be of most interest to us. Um, and uh, you can write down a second order differential equation um, for this case, and then write that in terms of the cosmographic um, parameters. And then there are two regimes of interest. There's the GR regime, where you get your standard growing mode, where delta goes like the scale factor, which would be proportional to t to the two thirds and the matter dominated epoch. Um, and then you get an F of R regime where typically your, your, den your density contrast will grow much faster than in the standard um, uh, matter dominated GR regime. Uh, so you have a transition between, uh, potential transition between GR uh, and F of R regime. Uh, and this will be your smoking gun for deviations away from the Lambda CDM uh, cosmology. So, um, so typically for a given F of R model, um, both of these regimes are possible um, for a particular scale relative, uh, relevant for large scale structure. There'll be a transition from the GR scale to the F of R regime. And the, the, the speed at which this transition occurs will be um, a measure of um, how different you are from the Lambda CDM cosmology. So during the matter dominated epoch, you're going to be close to this equilibrium point P3, which is the transient matter dominated epoch. And um, if you evolve quickly away from that point towards an F of R F of, the F of R regime where your matter perturbations grow much faster um, than the standard um, growth, growth rate, uh, standard T to the two thirds growth rate, then that will be your, your deviation away from the standard cosmology. And you can determine when this would occur. There'll be a particular um, criteria for when, it, when a wavelength lambda enters that this uh, F of R regime. And uh, we can examine when that occurs um, on, the, on the phase portrait in, in a rather straightforward way. So if we plot the projection of the three-dimensional phase space, which is uh, important to us, so this is now the projection where we have the deceleration parameter plotted against x. Remember, x equal to zero is the GR solution. So this line here is the GR solution. The shaded region is the, the region for which um, no instabilities will occur. Um, and here we have orbits which are passing by the, the, the transient matter-dominated epoch. Um, then if you consider um, this function, um, the, 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 this essentially gives you, gives you a measure of the slope of these, uh, of these orbits. And the steeper the, the slope of the, um, of the orbits um, are, the more quickly you deviate away from, or move away from the, the, the GR solution. So you can see here that um, there are essentially four possibilities that, uh, that could occur. Um, and let's uh, take these on in turn. So the red orbit uh, will move quickly away from the transient solution, the matter dominated transient solution, and will enter a region where you have an instability um, at, uh, before you enter an accelerated uh, period of expansion. So these orbits can be immediately discarded. Um, the orange orbits, they, they stay quite close to the GR solution for a period of time, but because they enter the region where an instability is likely to occur during a, a decelerated period of expansion, so Q is positive, um, you, you, you again end up with a set of solutions which again, which again are not viable and you can, and you can throw them away. Then as you move, a, move away from the X equal to zero line, um, you have two more possibilities. The green orbit, um, if you go back to, to, to if you look at the, 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 the slope of these orbits, then you see that um, they move rather quickly away from the GR regime. So they end up with perturbations which deviate away from 
the standard matter uh, growth rate rather quickly, um, but they stay within the uh, within the blue regime for much longer. Um, and um, uh, but because they have a growth rate which is very different from lambda CDM, they again can be uh, uh, thrown away as 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 not being being particularly viable solutions. So there's only really one set of, of orbits which is, is going to be of any interest to us. And those are the, the ones which are close to the brown orbit. They stay quite close to the x equal to zero line. Um, they will have growth rates which are not too different from the standard lambda CDM growth rate. And they will enter the, uh, they will, will, will exit the blue regime um, during a period where the universe is already accelerating. Um, so those are fairly viable solutions, but still different from your standard Lambda CDM um, uh, growth rate. So just to summarize the, the, result, uh, the results that we found, these are purely qualitative, by the way, that the, the, there's no quantitative results uh, that we've written down yet, but these are some nice sort of qualitative indicators of what might happen. Uh, so the results that we, we find are, are that, um, in a sense, the more we demand that the late time f of r cosmology be observationally close to a lambda CDM cosmology, the higher the risk is that it's physical, physically non-viable. In other words, um, the slope of these uh, um, these orbits, um, the the um, the orbits will will exit the blue regime and and hit a, a region where the uh, Dolkov uh, Kawasaki instability will occur. So that's uh, so that's one set of orbits that that uh, that will occur. The other set uh, relates to to a situation where the you know, the more that we try and construct a physically viable late time cosmology, in other words, we have the slope of these curves giving, um, you know, um, the, the, the curves staying relatively close to the x equal to zero line uh, for long enough to have a accelerated period of expansion. Um, the higher the risk is that uh, they, will be, they will be observationally different from the lambda CDM model. So just to go back to these plots. So in other words, these would correspond to, to orbits which stay a long time in the blue regime. In other words, make a transition between decelerated expansion and late time accelerated expansion, but transition from the, the so GR growth rate regime to an F of R growth rate regime uh, rather quickly. So these are the sort of brown curves um, through through the the green curves and beyond. These are those orbits. So they stay for, for a long time in the in the viable region, but they have growth rates which are very different from the lambda C, lambda CDM growth rates. So um, so it seems that um, if one insists that we have a background expansion rate which is identical to lambda CDM then you know it, it, it leads to two, two possibilities which are not particularly viable. One which enters a regime where we have instabilities rather quickly, and the other set of orbits which, um, which lead to growth rates which are very different from, from lambda CDM. So, um, so this is the, the result of, of fixing the, uh, the background expansion rate to be exactly the same as lambda CDM. So the method is rather nice. Um, it, uh, it can be used then to pin, we could pin down different expansion rates. Um, we can pin down the cosmography, then close the, the set of dynamical systems equations once we've pinned down the cosmography, and then look at the, the growth rate of perturbations along along the, the orbits which correspond to the background evolution and use that then as a way of, uh, of, um, of constraining those expansion rates. Um, so this is a much more general approach than the one that's been applied before where, where one considers case by case, different sets of, of, um, of F of R theories of gravity. This allows us to look at whole classes of F of R theories of gravity um, and focus on 
the background expansion and then the, um, the related growth rates, um, which are uh, which one, one obtains when one integrates the perturbation equations for the orbits of those background uh, solutions. So, um, so I'll, let me finish the talk now and, uh, and open it up for questions. Okay, okay, thank you, That's Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that Valerio has a question. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the talk, Peter, very nice. So I have a question about the Dolgo kawasaki instability. So this one arises when the effective mass squared of the scalar uh, F' prime of R becomes negative. So yeah. once you have some parameters, you have the, the cosmographic parameters, you should have a value for the mass M and uh, you should be able to estimate the time scale over which uh, the instability comes up. Do you have exactly. any? Exactly, it'll be, it'll more or less be a measure of the size of the blue region. Okay, so you have a number for that, uh, once you well, your we, model. We didn't, we didn't work it out in this case because we were looking at purely qualitative properties, but yes, in principle, you could work it out. You could actually quantify it by looking at the, effectively, it'll, it'll give you a measure of the size of the, of the, uh, of the blue region, which is uh, instability free. And that means that at that point, when the mass square becomes negative, you would have to modify the theory or modify the F of R at that point, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So what you want, what you basically want are orbits to, so we don't have any particular time scales here. This is something that we need to work out for each orbit. One could, one could do a, a sort of a quantitative analysis of the perturbations and the background and the, and the associated background expansion for each one of these orbits. But this gives an indication that um, if one, um, you know, the closer one is to the standard matter dominated evolution, um, the, the further one gets away from, you know, from uh, the standards or growth rates that one would expect um, to be consistent with uh, large scale structure constraints. Um, so this is a this is a problem. So either you exit rather quickly, um, and then you have the right the right correct growth rates, but then you hit you hit the instability, or you have uh, growth rates which are very different from the standard lambda CDM cosmology. But uh, your your expansion rate your your background expansion is fine. You have you know you have decelerated period and late time acceleration, but then your growth rates are very different. Um, and are not consistent with large construction constraints. Thanks. So those are the two options. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, we are a little bit late, but I just would like to ask you a very quick question, Peter. Uh, yeah. You quoted cosmography when you mm, take the initial conditions for your uh, dynamical system, but I um, I would like to ask you uh, the only possibility that you have to um, solve this system is to consider z equal to zero, the redshift equal to zero to close the system, or those cosmographic no, no, conditions. No. Okay. No, no, that's general. So basically, what you're doing here is you're you're fixing you're fixing the 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 the, the cosmography yeah. uh, for the particular background expansion, right? Oh, so that you thing, compute compute the cosmographic parameters. You compute the cosmo the you choose your background expansion. You then okay. compute your cosmography, which will then which will close for that particular um, expansion history. You know, um, um, and then that allows you to close off the the dynamical system. So you see, in general. Um, you have a hierarchy of dynamical systems equa equations which don't close. You can see here that the, uh, the equation governing the jerk parameter yeah. is coupled to that parameter. Yeah, sure. But then once you've, once you've pinned down your cosmography, then you can close the system. But you're not specifying the underlying theory of gravity. So you're not saying that you're working with a particular f of r theory of gravity here, you're just saying that um, the class of theories of it is f of r, and it has a particular ex expansion history. That's all. So in, in principle, you can, you can also uh, consider uh, an approximate versions of the, the, the cosmographic parameters, because you can expand q, j, and s. 
as well, because yeah. those are but, also, yeah. yeah, in sense that these quantities are also independent from the, um, the particular model. So in principle, you can expand them directly without fixing the cosmography, the background cosmography, I mean. And you can fix yeah, you could... the values of the, those expansions. That would be more yeah. model independent than you what you um, work it out in the sense that you that, that, that would be that would be even more model independent. Yeah, you yeah, could yeah, take particular things, particular particular expansion histories, work out the exact cosmography, and then close the equations. Or you could do things as you, as you describe, uh, and that would be more general. Yeah, yeah, okay. Or you, very even, much. or you could even take, or you could even take data, real data, and use that to constrain the different to close the differential equations in some approximate way, and then look at the constraints from that. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so I want to thank you again, Professor Dasby. Now it's the turn of Daniela Malafarina. Sorry for the late. Um, uh, Narayan has a question. So is there any uh, observational evidence uh, which supports uh, Yaffer cosmology? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Is there any evidence, uh, observational evidence um, that supports uh, Yaffer cosmology? Which cosmology? Yaffer cosmology, which, which Peter was talking. Sorry, uh, you're breaking up. I, I couldn't hear it, sorry. I couldn't. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, so, is there any observational evidence that supports um, F R cosmology that you were talking? Um, oh, F of R cosmology. Any yeah. observational evidence? Well, um, that they're, they're still not uh, ruled out. So, that the, if you have an expansion history which is sufficient, certainly at the, at the level of the, at the level of, of background of the background um, uh, theory, you can you can uh, design a F of R theory which is going to more or less mimic. The lambda CDM evolution. So this can be done, for example, in Huin Saviki, it can be done, done in other theories. Um, the deviations then arise when one looks at um, other constraints coming from uh, you know, logical structure um, or even constraints coming from uh, gravitational waves now. So um, but at the level of the at the level of the background, no, there's, there's you know they are they are they are fairly Fairly, fairly unconstrained. Um, but what we found in this analysis is that um, if one wants an exact lambda CDM expansion history, then um, these, these um, uh, F of R theories of, of, of gravity are, are, don't seem to be particularly well favored uh, by looking at the large scale structured data. Um, so you, know, you either run it in stabilities or you run into a situation where your growth rate is, uh, is uh, sufficiently different from the standard um, growth rates that one gets in Lambda CDM. So one needs expansion histories which are close to Lambda CDM, but not exactly the same as Lambda CDM. And then one can probably construct theories which, uh, which, which are uh, fairly consistent with, um, with various data, data sets, not just the background uh, uh, evolution. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, so thank you again, Peter. Okay, let's thank you, pass now. Thank you. Let's pass now to Daniele Malafarina. Um, we are a little bit late. <laughs> I'm sorry okay. for that, but I think it's quite obvious that discussions will take a little bit of time. So please, Daniela, share the screen as you wish. So, yes. I hope you can all see the full I, screen. I think shared. so, at least I see. Yeah. So, I think so. So, yeah, first of all, I'm very happy to be here in Rome. Oh, no, wait a second. We are not in Rome. <laughs> But I hope that we will have chances to have conferences in person again soon, uh, because I personally miss it. And I believe that uh, most of you feel the same. So thank you for having me, even though remotely. And um, 
sorry about uh, we're talking about a topic that is a little bit off topic from today. That's entirely my fault uh, because I was scheduled on another day and I kindly asked or Orlando to reschedule me because I couldn't uh, make it on uh, Tuesday. And so now we have to leave cosmology for a bit and bear with me for 15 minutes when we talk about uh, black holes and uh, black hole mimickers. I will, very general for a few minutes, trying to uh, just uh, plant some ideas in, in your head just to you know put some doubts and something that you may think about. I don't have answers, but uh, I think there are some questions that are uh, worth asking and some uh, studies that you can do in order to try to get uh, to those answers. So this is, uh, overall a summary of work that has been done over a long time with several collaborators from uh, Asia and Central Asia and, um, and uh, India and hopefully in the future also Italy but uh, by all means there's other people by no means I'm on the only you know, we are the only people working on this there's other people that are, are working on similar ideas all around and um, just to get um, uh, very slowly into uh, what I would like to uh, suggest and the things that I would like to talk about. Black holes appear to be everywhere and uh, we have two kinds of objects that we're dealing with. That is the mathematical black holes that come from our uh, theory of general relativity and the astrophysical black holes that come from the abundance of observations that are finally coming, uh, finally becoming available after uh, we had to wait for so many years. So the big question is, are those two things the same thing? Um, it's uh, worth mentioning that black holes are not only popular in the field for us, but they're becoming popular everywhere. Several Nobel Prizes have been awarded for gravitational waves, for uh, uh, cosmology, and uh, more recently for Sagittarius A star, and to uh, Professor Penrose, uh, for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of general relativity. So it's a robust prediction of general relativity. You need general relativity. And if you are willing to give up general relativity, then you may have to give up black holes as well. I would guess that most people would agree with that. Uh, but how that must be done, that should be done, uh, is the thing that I would like to argue about. So. The big question is, is this a black hole? Now we have this beautiful picture. Uh, it's an astrophysical object. It's definitely a black hole candidate. Uh, general relativity works very well in describing this. But at the same time, we know that general relativity has some shortcomings. If this is a black hole, it's a Kerr black hole, there's going to be a singularity behind the horizon. And that's the, actually the result of the theorems that uh, were initiated by Penrose and uh, Hawking and so on. And if that's the case, then the universe has a bit of a problem because uh, singularities are, I would say, since the 50s onwards in general relativity, thought to be shortcomings of our understanding of gravity, not an actual feature of the universe. So if you want to remove a singularity, then you need to adjust your black hole solution accordingly. And then you're leaving general relativity and you may leave in uh, also black holes uh, behind. So they may still look like that, but they may not be exactly a curved black hole as described by the curved space-time in general relativity. And there's lots of those. There's only one that we have a picture of a shadow and so that can probe very close to the region where uh, you know, the horizon is located. But there's lots of other candidates that now we've been observing over years in stellar mass extreme binaries, AGNs, quasars, then there is the shadow of M87, and then now there's more and more uh, gravitational waves that are being observed from the merger of uh, two uh, black hole candidates. So all of these observations fit very well with the paradigm of general relativity, but they're not so many. Uh, quasars and AGNs, they are a lot, but also I would argue that they are the observations in which you list, list solid ground on which to claim that that must be a black hole. Of shadow, we have only M87. Of the orbits of uh, stars, we have only Sagittarius A star. Gravitational waves are growing, but so far there's only a handful of those. If you need a statistical sample of, let's say, hundreds of thousands or maybe millions in order to start to see some departures from GR, we may be still uh, far from that. But the great thing is that 
we are getting the data. And so eventually, if some departures are there, we will see it. So obvious departures can be ruled out, but more subtle departures may not. Our mathematical uh, black holes, they have these two defining features, the singularity and the event horizon. So the one that I take issues with, and I would believe that most people have issues with, is the singularity. And um, I've been doing some work on collapse and models for collapse to, to black holes, and I've been growingly convinced of the fact that as soon as you try to tinker with the singularity in order to get some models that are singularity free in one way or another within GR or within some effective or semi-classical models, then you have to change also the horizon. There is no way that you can play and remove the singularity and leave the event horizon completely unaffected. So some effects will have to alter the horizon structure as well. If these alterations are very small, they may be uh, invisible, they may be, may be not detectable. But if these alterations are um, uh, significant enough, then we may see effects due to the removal of the singularity already at the horizon structure or at the horizon level. So all of this relies on the belief that general relativity holds very well all the way until we're very close to the singularity. So basically classical GR works well until we reach a regime in which basically we need a quantum theory of gravity. But there is no real fundamental reason for that. Uh, the fact that we think about quantum gravity and the Planck scale where the correction should arise is that basically we are playing around with uh, fundamental constants, speed of light, Newton's constant, and uh, Planck constant. So when you combine those, you get some length scale, some density scale, some mass scales, and so on, that tell you that at that scale, energy scales, at that scale, GR will fail, and that you can be sure. But there is no reason to think that it may not fail even before that, and there may be some other alternative theory of gravity that has to kick in way before we are close to the singularity. For example, this alternative theory of gravity may kick in already at the horizon level when QMG over C squared goes towards uh, one. So let me just uh, skip this little mention of singularities. We don't want to think that singularities are actual physical thing. And so let's hope that singularities may be visible or may have some effects that are visible so that we can actually probe uh, how general relativity breaks. And uh, how to deal with uh, avoidance of singularity is by uh, changing the metafields, the right-hand side of Einstein equations, or the left-hand side, or changing general relativity. So what I was saying a moment ago is basically this. There is no real reason that we have to believe that the Planck scale um, has to be the fundamental scale at which GR fails, and the GR will hold and change all the way until there. In fact, if you think about uh, classical mechanics and Newtonian theory, there is nothing in Newton's theory that tells you where it should break. Uh, there is no h-bar in Newton's theory, and there is nothing in the theory that tells you that it cannot go all the way until infinitesimal uh, sizes and uh, extremely high densities and so on. So the, the failure of uh, Newton's theory comes from the fact that we found observations in which that was not confirmed. So there may be some observations that will come at some point in the future that will tell us that maybe GR fails at the level that is not close to the singularity, but it's already at the horizon level. One possibility is, for example, if you assume that uh, cosmological constant is a fundamental constant, then you can play with that and obtain a new set of lengths and scales and energy and masses and so on. So this is not an approach that many people would uh, actually take. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but anyway, I put a very nice red uh, ellipse in order to highlight where I would like to go. And uh, it's not that I prefer one to the other. Uh, I've been looking at modifications close to the singularity and modifications close to the horizon. I think that uh, point number two is a road that is less traveled and it's still worth investigating. So this is the reason why I'm talking about it here. There is no real reason to prefer one to the other. I think that both are worth checking. And the second one is an option that is not checked uh, so much. So let's suppose that GR fails somewhere close to the horizon uh, scale. So then 
would there be an horizon or not? You know, in order for the black hole to form, you would have the object to settle to the care geometry uh, eventually. So you may have an object that is slightly deformed, that is rotating above the care limit, and as it collapses, it has to shed away all the excess angular momentum, all the deformations, and so on, so that when the black hole forms, the object set on to care, and there is no other way. What if some of the excess angular momentum is retained? What if some of the deformation, the object that is collapsing, doesn't shed away all the higher multiple moments that uh, make uh, the, its shape a little bit oblate or prolate? Uh, in that case, the geometry cannot be that uh, of a black hole. And so, since uh, we have uh, Penrose theorems, we know that GR has to give in at some point there. So let's take the assumption that our object, as it collapses, um, it keeps uh, some of its higher uh, multiple moment. Um, I'm not going to talk about angular momentum because when you want to solve the equations by hand analytically, adding angular momentum, it's complicated. So when talking about black holes, I'll be thinking about Schwarzschild. And when talking about objects that are not black hole, I'll be thinking about static uh, sources that have some higher mass multiples, so no angular momentum. So in that sense, we know that there's lots of solutions of Einstein equations that a uh, vacuum solution that describes the exterior of objects that are not black holes, how physical they are. That's the big question. We don't know how physical some of these uh, solutions are. Some of them are clearly unphysical. Some of them are more there, more there borderline. And so if I assume that the GR fails close to the horizon scale, the horizon doesn't form and the object that collapses retains some of its higher uh, mass multiples, then I can think that those solutions of Einstein equations, the vacuum field equations that are not black hole, may describe the exterior uh, field of such a source. So that's the point of view that I'm following here. And that's the point of view that I think it's interesting. It's very valid. And not many people seem to be very interested in that because very often people go into alternative theories, as we're talking about here, by choosing an alternative theory and seeing how it changes the black hole in that theory. But nobody thinks about, okay, let's take GR, let's see the solutions in GR that are not black holes. And those may tell me maybe some indication of if and how and when GR may fail. So I don't assume an alternative theory. I'm assuming that the exterior is one of these objects that is not a black hole and it's going to be valid up until a certain point. And then at some point between the, where the horizon would be and where the theory fails, then there's a new theory that has to kick in, which I don't know, which I'm not assuming. So if I want to do that, um, I'm thinking about looking solutions within uh, GR and without horizon. The solutions within GR and without horizon, where there would be an horizon, typically they have a naked singularity. So this is an ugly thing. This is uh, objectively a, a bad thing. I remove the singularity at the center of the black hole with another singularity that it's possibly even worse. But these singularities may be milder sometimes, maybe you know, a little more easily treated. But the point is that I don't have to get that close. The presence of that singularity tells me that where there would be the horizon, general relativity has failed. And so my boundary of the object is slightly bigger than that. Could be a Planck scale, a Planck length larger than that, or could be larger than that depending on the scale, the intrinsic scale of this, uh, this new theory. So to investigate whether this is possible from astrophysical sources, what we do is we take some of these solutions within GR that supposedly describe the exterior field of these uh, objects, and then go to look for how they would appear. How would I be able to distinguish that uh, exterior field from the exterior field of a black hole? The easiest and uh, most straightforward and most meaningful one to start with, that is the one that we've been dealing with for the past few years, is the so-called gamma metric, also known as uh, Zippoi Boris metric, which is a static vacuum axially symmetric solution of Einstein equations, which is continuously linked uh, to the Schwarzschild solution through one parameter, usually called gamma, even though uh, some people would prefer to call it Q because it's a parameter that is connected to the quadrupole moment. And so it's a parameter that describes basically how deformed uh, the source is from a sphere, where Schwarzschild being a sphere. 
Some of you may know uh, the line elements, some of you may not. So I'll go very briefly here. This is the general form of the static uh, axially symmetric vacuum solutions. It's called uh, Vioclass. It depends on two uh, functions. And uh, there's basically only one equation that you need to solve to solve the system completely. And it's this Laplace equation in, uh, in uh, two dimension. Once you solve that, the other two equations are solved by quadrature. So in principle, all solutions of this class are known. And in principle, there's an infinite amount of solutions of this class. The gamma metric is particularly interesting because, uh, it, because of its symmetry, because it's continuously linked to the Schwarzschild. So when gamma is equal to one, you get exactly Schwarzschild. But when gamma is different from one, uh, you get an object that may be slightly deformed, slightly oblate or prolate in shape. And um, that makes it appealing because it allows us through the change of this parameter gamma to probe how we go from black hole to non-black hole cases. The interesting thing is that when gamma is not one, r equal to 2m, this is written now in Schwarzschild-like coordinates. So these are, this reduces to Schwarzschild exactly in Schwarzschild coordinates when gamma is equal to one. When gamma is different from one, r equal to 2m is a curvature singularity which to me is very interesting because I can think about a supermassive black hole of billions of times the mass of the sun would have a horizon that is uh, somewhere uh, uh, at uh, several astronomical units uh, from, uh, from the center. And if I add one atom somewhere close to that horizon, that one atom would be enough to deform the geometry and make that horizon uh, a singularity. Of course, you may argue, okay, as the atom folds in, as it is attracted towards the singularity, then the black hole will emit the gravitational waves that get rid of the higher multiple moments and settle to short. This is the most conservative uh, view that you may have on, on the thing, and it's perfectly valid. But let me entertain the possibility that instead, that atom may settle on a surface that is not uh, a horizon, will not fall towards the singularity at the center, and this object is not perfectly spherical. It uh, becomes a sphere with one atom added somewhere. So if that's the case, then a solution like the gamma metric would be enough to, to describe that. Um, all higher multiple moments are present. Uh, we stop here with the quadruple moment. The total gravitational mass as measured from infinity also can be calculated. And uh, depending on whether gamma is positive or negative, then the shape of the object is either oblate or prolate. Uh, the singularity I mentioned, so there is no reason to go into the fact that R equal to 2M is an actual true curvature singularity. And so what did we do? We wanted to look at how to distinguish this uh, line element from, uh, uh, from a black hole. So we studied particle motion around it. We studied, uh, the, for example, the motion of accretion disks, or if you're thinking about supermassive black holes, the motion of stars near, or the shadow, similarly to what is done uh, when, for example, when you take a picture of uh, M87, so that you can, in principle, compare the two and put some constraints on the value of gamma. Of course, this is static, so for astrophysical objects, one has to go to a uh, rotating solution. So you calculate the innermost stable circular orbit, and you see that it depends on gamma, and in that case, you see that there is a degeneracy between um, the gamma metric and care, for example, because by measurement of the innermost stable circular orbit only, if I measure a certain value for the ISCO, then that could be a curved black hole with a certain angular momentum or um, a gamma metric with a certain quadruple moment. So I would not be able to distinguish the two. I would not be able to distinguish care uh, rotating and black hole from the gamma metric, static and deformed, only from one measurement. I would, be, I would need more measurements in order to distinguish the two. And this is a common theme that comes out. Uh, you can calculate the photon orbits also for the shadow and so on. And so typically what you see is that one measurement is never enough, but multiple measurements may break this degeneracy and allow you to tell you uh, if you're looking at a Schwarzschild black hole or a gamma metric. Here you see all the relevant uh, uh, orbits in the most stable circular orbits, the marginally bound orbits, the photon sphere, or let's say photon capture radius. Here down here, you have 2m. And so gamma equal to one is Schwarzschild, and then you see how they change for gamma positive and gamma negative. Gamma positive are, of course, more physically realistic because thinking about an object that uh, rotates, that's what uh, kind of deformation you would get. 
other things you may look at, I'm not going to stay here in the detail because I'm already approaching 20 minutes, is harmonic oscillations. So you may have harmonic oscillations actually when you have gas accreting on the central object, this gas may move about circular orbits and emit in, with some frequencies that may allow you to um, measure these epicyclic frequencies from the spectrum of the accretion disk. So this is something that in principle at least could be, could be measured. And then you can see again how that departs and you can compare it with Schwarzschild, gamma with different values of care with different values of the uh, angular momentum. And then we started, so here I will just mention without going into detail, uh, spinning particles orbiting the, the gamma metric. And then you guess as you add the spin of the particle, then you have one more parameter to play with and then even more degeneracy is. Or you can immerse the, the source into an external electromagnetic field or, uh, and then you would see again how the particle orbits are uh, affected. Or probably the most interesting one, how the motion of photons in the vicinity of the source is affected, then compare it. Here we have Kerr, Schwarzschild, and gamma with two values smaller than one. I left this gamma with 0 0.25, which is physically uh, maybe not realistic, but is interesting because it's a region where you have some repulsive effects. And you see that here, as the photons are close to the source, they are actually repelled. And this is a very peculiar feature of this space time, which makes probably very small values of gamma not uh, physically realistic, but still interesting to, to study. And then the last thing is uh, the, the shadow. So you compare here, for example, Schwarzschild to what you would see here from the gamma metric. And you see that for certain values of gamma, now here the source would be here. Right? There's, don't get confused by the fact that, um, that the picture on the left is smaller, smaller just because we wanted to have the same, the same size of the picture. Yeah? So, you could, in principle, compare. But if gamma is very close to one, then you can tell that uh, the difference between the shadow of a Schwarzschild black hole and the shadow of a gamma metric would be almost indistinguishable. So can we actually put some uh, constraints from observations? Well, the gamma metric is non-rotating, so we would have to, I'm, I'm finishing, uh, we would have to consider um, rotating sources, so a rotating equivalent of the gamma metric, which is something that we are starting to do right now. And so finally, where would we be able to actually see these things? Could we see that in the orbit of stars around Sagittarius A star? Unlikely, because these effects would happen very close to the horizon, and the closest star seen so far is at almost a 1,000 astronomical units, which is way too far for these effects to actually be visible unless you wait for long enough time and they can uh, become uh, accumulate over time and then become visible but it would take over centuries or more in the shadow that's a better chance because you're actually probing something that is uh, much closer but also we would have to have better data from the event horizon telescope in, in order to actually tell uh, and put some constraints on quadrupole moment in the care uh, geometry outside uh, m87 black hole and then in the spectrum of accretion disk of uh, X-ray binaries so for stellar mass black holes and in quasars and AGMs. This is another place where you could actually look. But uh, again, the spectrum of the accretion disk is a very complicated thing that has several components. And so there is a lot of physics that goes in there and may uh, blur or may remove your signal that shows you the departure from the black hole geometry uh, because it's all hidden under uh, all of the actual uh, physics of the emission and the reflection and the corona and so on. But as more data is gathered and as we uh, get more and more observations in the future, possibly these things would be tested. And so I believe these are interesting questions to ask and also questions that hopefully can be answered within uh, a few years. So with this, I conclude and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniele. So, any questions? Uh, I would like just to ask you, why have you chosen exactly the gamma metric? Is that is there a particular reason? Because it is the simplest one after Schwarzschild in sense of quadrupole it's momentum. A, uh, it's simple enough. So the, the, the line element is simple enough. And uh, even though you know, there's lots of possibility that one could choose. And in fact, there's lots of interesting space times that could be considered and uh, 
people have not considered yet. So this is uh, simple enough in terms of uh, line element. And it's the, the gamma, the parameter gamma is continuous. And so you can link it to Schwarzschild uh, continuously, which is also a nice feature. Very famous uh, solutions that belong to the vial class. There is also the Erez Rosen solution, which is a, um, also yes. has quadrupole moment and high multiple moments, but the line element is a lot more complicated. There's a monopole quadrupole solution, which is interesting because it has, has only the monopole and the quadrupole and nothing else. But then again, the line element is, is extremely complicated. There is a very simple solution that is the Curzon solution, which is in fact the vial monopole. With, that is even simpler than this, but it's not linked to Schwartz. This is, if you want to get the physical intuition of what the Curzon solution is, when you're looking at Schwartz, you're thinking about looking at the sphere from very large distances. When you're looking at Curzon, you're looking at the thin disk from very large distances. So they are not continuously linked. And then since this Laplace equation is linear, there's all the superposition of all of those and all of them are going to be also solutions. So in principle, you can play with them and get uh, more and more solutions. So if you want something that you can treat and something that is uh, sort of related to Schwarzschild in some sense, this is the most natural choice. And um, I didn't talk about Manko. There are other, other solutions, Manko, I don't remember, Novikov and, uh, and several others. So the Quevedo uh, knows uh, for sure a lot more of those solutions as well. And then there are some rotating solutions that get very complicated and that is where we would like to move next. Okay, if nobody wants to ask other questions, maybe we can thank you again, Daniele. Thanks. So Professor Malatorina, thank you again. Now it's the turn of, uh, no, Valeria, Valeria, Valeria has a question, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you for the nice talk, Daniele. So uh, you may have said this, but I missed it, if you did. Uh, this solution, this gamma metric is a vacuum solution, right? Yeah, yes, 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 so, yes. Have you thought, uh, when you try to get the rotating version, have you thought about applying the Newman genius metric? Because for Varchild, uh, that gives you care, if you apply. If you apply so the Newman, the Newman genius algorithm, uh, it's very complicated and uh, we, uh, not, I didn't try to apply it, but my colleagues, uh, Cosimo Bambi and his uh, people in Shanghai, they tried that. And um, they actually, I think they have a paper in which they couldn't get a rotating solution from the, from the gamma metric with the Newman genius algorithm. So there may be some other ways of doing it. Maybe the way they did it, it's not the only one, but um, there are solutions with some that belong to stationary, stationary solutions that are a generalization of the gamma metric. So there already exist some, but they haven't been studied much. And one of the solutions that I looked first, again, I was looking for simplicity. I found a solution by Alisoy that claimed to, there was a whole class and one of those claimed to be a rotating generalization of the gamma metric. And it turned out it was not a rotating generalization. It was a generalization of the nut space time. So it would get a nut space time with the gamma parameter. Again, you can play with all those parameters. You have Schwarzschild, then you have the gamma parameter, and you have from Schwarzschild you can go to gamma, from Schwarzschild you can go to nut, and if you put these two together, you get this solution by Alisoy, which he didn't realize that that was the case, and he thought it was an actual spinning solution. And there's another solution that we're looking at right now that was developed by Mashun and uh, I don't remember who else. That is in fact a rotating generalization of the gamma metric. Um, plus there are others by Witten and, and others that uh, we haven't looked at uh, yet. So there are solutions that already exist that are rotating generalizations. Can, the can the Newman algorithm, sorry? The Kevedo mushroom metric, the mushroom Kevedo metric. I look at that, I don't remember if it's exactly generalization or generalization of this one, uh, or if it has also some other features. Uh, because okay, I, I think the Kevedo mushroom metric to reduce, I don't, I don't remember now, I don't want to say something wrong. Maybe not, maybe not, I'm not sure. But it is a rotating solution, it's a vacuum solution. It belongs to these to this class of rotating solutions with the quadrupole mass monopole. Uh, yeah, yes. with the quadrupole, with the mass quadrupole, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Daniele, very nice talk. So now thanks. it's the turn of uh, 
Tiago Gonçalves. So I want to apologize with him because we are very late. <laughs> Unfortunately, maybe we we should reduce the time of uh, the, the big time in sense that we have to cut something later. <laughs> So mm -hmm. take your time to have your uh, your talk. In principle, 15 minutes if you are able to to be in this interval. Otherwise, okay, take your time because clearly I understand that we need a little a little bit of time more. Uh, it's obvious, as I told before. Okay, please, it's your turn. Thank you. So I believe you're seeing my screen now. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to give this talk. It's actually my very first talk in a conference as I begin my PhD. Uh, I'll be talking about um, uh, some work, ongoing work we've been doing, uh, uh, I'm doing together with uh, Francis Globo and Juan Luis Rosa uh, in uh, F of RT gravity. Uh, I'll give a, a very short introduction to uh, this modified theory of gravity. Uh, now, a lot of work has already been done uh, in this theory. The novelty really is the, the equivalent scalar tensor representation, uh, which was published this year. And then so we take that to um, make our study and we use reconstruction methods uh, to find some cosmological solutions. And I'll be presenting here a preview of, of, of some of them. Uh, uh, so as we've been discussing, we have, I mean, we have general relativity, which is um, very good, uh, but this, our picture of the universe is still not quite yet complete. So we'd like to explore all uh, possibilities. One such possibility is F of RT, which was uh, first proposed in 2011, and which generalizes the Einstein-Hilbert action so where instead of appearing just the uh, Ricci scalar, we now have a general function of the Ricci scalar and the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So I'll just show here the full action with the, the general function and the matter Lagrangian. Uh, this action uh, through variation gives the following field equations. They are very similar to the ones from the theory of F, F of R. Uh, Except, of course, as one would expect, uh, some extra terms. Uh, this bit here, the one, the terms in brackets, just corresponds uh, to the uh, uh, variation of the trace of the energy momentum tensor with respect to the metric. Uh, and here, I'm just I'm defining the uh, derivatives of f with respect to t and r with the subscripts. Now, this having this two extra degrees of freedom, we would expect it that in a scalar tensor representation, we will have uh, two dynamical uh, scalar fields. Um, and this was then work only done this year. Uh, I'm not here showing the derivation uh, that Juan Luis uh, Rosa has published. Uh, I just go straight to the uh, formal, uh, the formulation, the final formulation in, in the theory. Uh, which has an action where it replaces the uh, f of rt uh, general function with this expression here. So we have the two scalar fields, phi being defined as a de the derivative of f with respect to r, psi the same thing with respect to t, uh, and an interaction potential, which is defined uh, in a way such that we just recover uh, the geometrical representation once again. Uh, we've noticed throughout the, um, the analysis that uh, phi will always uh, be associated with the curvature uh, part and psi with the, the source. Um, so once again, just showing here the uh, full action. Varying this action with respect to the metric yields very similar uh, field equations to the ones uh, in the geometrical, except of course with the uh, new definitions, so those two scalar fields and the potential v. However, now we also have two new extra uh, equations by varying the action with respect to each of the fields, uh, and they are rather simple. I show them here. They I've defined here as well again 
the subscript as a, the derivative, so the derivative of the potential with respect to phi, giving r, and the same thing for psi. So this is the, the theory where we've, def, we've taken to develop our work. Um, and uh, to do this cosmological analysis, we, uh, we've chosen to work in uh, a universe described by uh, FLRW metric uh, and filled with an isotropic and homogeneous perfect fluid. In this framework, we're working with eight degrees of freedom. So the scale, scale factor, curvature parameter, density and pressure, the two scalar fields and the potential with its associated two degrees of freedom. And we're able uh, in general to uh, build a system of equations. We have consistent, uh, of, uh, consistency with seven equations of on, only six of them are independent. Uh, so not quite yet enough uh, for the eight degrees of freedom. We'll have to in, uh, place some further constraints further, uh, further on down the line. But for now, I'll just um, enumerate these equations and we will work with these equations first to get uh, some general solutions. So we have the uh, equation of state. We also get two equations from uh, conservation uh, considerations. Now here um, in these theories, which couple matter with the curvature, usually uh, the uh, energy momentum is not conserved. In general, we can have a general a total conservation, but this one is not conserved. However, in this work, we will impose uh, the condition that matter itself is also conserved, hence the two equations here. Then the two equations from the scalar fields, which, which uh, we've, we've just seen, and the two uh, coming from uh, the independent components uh, of the field equations, uh, which I show here, giving us the modified Friedman equations. I write them here with I've highlighted here in a different color uh, the parts that may, may resemble the, the, the corresponding parts in the, the standard Friedman equations in uh, general relativity. Now, out of the seven equations we have, the, uh, the second one will actually be the one uh, that we'd not use, uh, given that it's the most uh, complicated of, of the seven, and only six of them would be independent anyway. And instead we use the, the equation we get from the conservation considerations I was talking about and which I will give some further detail here. So we gave, um, we have the total conservation we get from taking the covariant derivative of the field equations. And then further on also imposing the conservation of matter itself. We get this rather nice and simple uh, equation where we can see that there's no longer any dependence on the scalar field phi. And so if we know uh, the density, which we can from conservation of matter and the pressure just by applying the equation of state, then we'll be able to uh, solve this one already for the, the scalar field psi. And this is exactly what we do, even without specifying uh, the scale factor or the curvature, nor the uh, equation of state. We have the familiar result that we also have in GR for the density, pressure just applying the equation of state. And here then is the solution for the scalar field psi. Having these, we are now in position as well to find uh, at least part of the potential, which we find to be separable. And uh, we are able to solve for the part that depends on psi. The only thing now left for us to, to solve for is the scalar field phi and to find its part in the potential. To do that, we'll then need to impose further constraints. Uh, now, there's different approaches we could have taken. We've decided to choose uh, the form of the scale factor. And in our work, we, we do with three different forms, uh, uh, inspired by the different epochs of the evolution of the universe in, in GR. So the, uh, and we actually in this presentation, I'll be just focusing on 
the uh, the first one, so the accelerated expansion, not least because it's the the what we currently observe to be the late time behavior of the universe. Um, and we may ask whether this theory can explain this current expansion. Uh, indeed, the answer is, ye is yes. And not only that, but it also um, is able uh, to do that for not only for a cosmological constant or an equation of state at minus one, but also for other equations of state. So here I just went on and uh, showed an overview of uh, examples of solutions. Uh, for each of the variables. I don't want to focus here on the details, it's just to illustrate uh, the fact that we are, we, are, we are being able to find these solutions and consistent, all of these consistent with uh, an accelerated expansion. Uh, having found um, these solutions, the, so the complete, as I've, having resolved the, the system, uh, we might wonder whether we can find the, the form of f of r t for this. And so we have already the definition from the, sca in the, from the scalar tensor representation. We found uh, potential for particular cases. Here I present uh, just an example, the same one that was plotted in the previous uh, slide um, for, for the flat universe and uh, a, dom a matter dominated uh, universe still with the uh, exponential expansion. We also have from one of the equations, we can get the uh, a relation between the trace of the energy momentum tensor and the derivative of f with respect to that same trace. And so we are in a position to, to, to solve for uh, f of rt, which we also find to be separable. And here again, I just show um, one, uh, uh, one such example for the same uh, example, and where I write explicitly the dependence on r and on t. So this, in a way, uh, have come uh, almost full, full circle. So I think this is a, a good point. Uh, for me to conclude and uh, uh, this talk where I've, um, I've explained a bit of how we've taken this um, uh, modified theory of gravity, uh, which has the two extra degrees of freedom, which then, uh, as one would expect, um, gives rise to two scalar fields in the scalar tensor representation. And this is really the, the novelty here, the scalar tensor representation published this year. Um, which uh, we've taken then to solve the, the solutions, to solve for uh, different co cosmo cosmologies. And we find that, um, as perhaps one could expect as well, given that we have the extra degrees of freedom, um, we can explain, for example, a, an exponential expansion uh, with a matter-dominated uh, universe. With this, then I conclude and I thank you once again. Uh, so hopefully the, you'll be able to find more details when the, uh, the paper comes out, but obviously I'll, I'll be happy to answer any, any immediate questions you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tiago. So you were perfectly in time. Excellent. <laughs> so any questions? Well, a very quick question could be um, from my side at least. Um, is there any possibility to disentangle uh, F of R theories, the, the, one, the ones that have been cited by Peter at the very beginning of this session with yours, I mean, F of R T, the ones that you are proposing here? Is it possible, I don't know, from observations, reconstructions to get some hints uh, on how to disentangle to understand if we have one theory instead of another one. I mean, what do you think about? Uh, so from observationally, so perhaps, uh, so perhaps the good, good thing about the theory is that uh, with the extra two degrees of freedom, um, 
we can explain um, observations, but also by getting the two extra degrees of freedom, then uh, it opens up uh, a lot of other possibilities. So it's harder to uh, perhaps distinguish. Uh, I'm not, uh, but, it, but it's uh, it's something I've, I've, I I I need to ponder on, and uh, I'll I'll need to uh, ponder as I progress with this work. I think. Okay, no, the question was based on the fact that I think at least that this approach is uh, model dependent because you fixed the scale factor, you assume many things. And so probably uh, you can have some degenerations uh, on other theories that could explain the same things using um, alternative assumptions, I mean. Uh, but by the way, um, mine was only a curiosity, nothing special. Okay, so... Any other questions? It seems no questions. So thank you for your very good talk, uh, Tiago. So um, in principle, we should have something like 30 minutes of, uh, for coffee break. But since we are very late, uh, I'm sorry for that. I think we can meet again at 10 past six. So what do you think? Because the standard time was six o'clock to restart the, 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 the session. But I think 10 minutes after six would be would be fine. If also Valerio, that is the next speaker, uh, agrees. And with you only, uh, with you all, obviously. I'm easy. OK. So see you here in uh, 20 minutes, more or less, 10 half six, uh, after six. Thank you. Valerio, have you had your coffee? Your self coffee. <laughs> I had it before. Okay. Let's wait and just a couple of minutes because. Yeah, yeah, sure. I was just sharing. I told everybody. I had a glitch. I had a glitch with the internet, and I was trying to make sure that everything still works. Okay. 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 What, Great. No what problem. Time is it? What time is it, Valerio? What time? Yeah. It's a noon now. Okay. No, well, okay. 15 minutes if possible. And we can start from 10 past six in five minutes. Valerio, please, in yeah. 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll try to keep it uh, to, to the time. Sorry, Orlando, I broke all the rules. No problem. I like that you broke the rules because, as you know, this parallel session is going further the, the standard models and so you broke the standard model and that's fine <laughs> no that's okay we can't go anyway anywhere anyway so. yeah no problem i don't know maybe the organizers will stop the um, automatically the, the session uh, at uh, half past seven maybe if I understood correctly. But oh. before that time, I think that we have also enough time to go further with our talks. In principle, I don't know if other people want to go out to do something different. So that's why I I think it's better to, to stay in 15 minutes, but otherwise we have enough time, I mean.
So I think it's the Valerius turn now. I will introduce him. So please, Valerio, you can start if you wish. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very well. Good. So um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to talk and present these ideas. This is work done with Andrea Giusti and Jeremy Cote here at Bishop's University. And I uh, would like to talk about a new approach to the thermodynamics of gravity, in particular to the thermodynamics of scalar tensor gravity. So this is the outline of the talk. First of all, I will remind people how you can describe scalar tensor gravity as an effective fluid. This turns out to be an effective and dissipative fluid and a near rotational one. And I would like to take uh, this, this um, fact uh, with the extreme consequences, which are not that extreme really. So there are two ideas that have been around for a while, although in a totally different context. The idea that general relativity could be an equilibrium state in a wider spectrum of theories of gravity. And um, if you adopt this idea with this new approach, we can obtain a, an expression for the temperature of gravity in the space of theory and the shear viscosity of scalar tensor gravity. And then uh, we can describe an approach to the equilibrium state that is general relativity or deviation from it, uh, and all this with relatively minimal assumptions. So at the end, I will have uh, some conclusions and I will outline some of them problems. So the motivation is that uh, uh, these two ideas uh, that actually came out about 10 years apart uh, from um, the thermodynamics of space time. Although I want to stress that what I'm going to talk about is completely different from the usual thermodynamics of space time approach. So the first idea is that it's possible that gravity emerges as some sort of emergent theory as uh, some fluid mechanical or thermodynamical limit or some underlying and uh, more basic, more fundamental theory. So this is the idea of deriving the Einstein equation as an effective equation of state, which has had a lot of followers. The second idea that came out about 10 years after the first paper by Jacobson is that if you take a landscape of theories of gravity, general relativity could be the state of equilibrium and modified gravity could be an excited state corresponding to higher temperature while general relativity would correspond to zero temperature. Now, this idea was introduced in the context of F of R theories of gravity. Here, I'm going to uh, revisit this idea in a totally different context, but uh, in the general family of scalar tensor gravity. And F of R gravity is just one subclass of this theory. So again, for the motivation, scalar tensor gravity is the prototype of the alternative to general relativity. F of R gravity, which is extremely popular to explain the current acceleration of the universe, as you have heard from Peter a while ago, is a, a, a proposal is very popular and it doesn't require the introduction of an dark energy, which is a dog. So in a scalar tensor gravity, you can recast the field equations as effective Einstein equation by moving all the geometric terms different from the Einstein tensor to the right hand side and manipulating slightly. So you can regard the right hand side as an effective stress energy tensor of a fluid, as an effective fluid. So just to remind you of uh, equations that you probably have seen many times, the Jordan frame action for scalar tensor gravity is this one here. So I'm just taking a general action. The scalar field phi is effectively the inverse uh, of the effective gravitational coupling and it couples explicitly to the Ricci scalar. There is this branch Ricci term here, which is allowed to be a function of phi in general scalar tensor gravity. I'm talking about older generation scalar tensor gravity. I'm talking about Tornadesky and merge modern formulations of the theory, and then you get the matter part of the action. So when you vary the action, these are the field equations. Again, I'm sure you have seen it many times. This is the most common form in which the Jordan frame field equations are presented. So the question is, can you regard that this uh, right hand side, so these terms uh, uh, that are uh, dependent on phi, not the matter term, the, the terms depend on phi, can you regard them as an effective fluid? Well, the answer is yes, and uh, more or less everybody has done it in some particular context, maybe cosmology, maybe spherical solution, some other ideas. So the correspondence is possible if the gradient of the scalar field is time-like, then you can normalize it and get the four velocity of this effective fluid. And uh, the three-dimensional space seen by the co-moving observer with this fluid is given by this um, Riemannian metric HAB. The mixed tensor is the usual projection tensor operator on the three space seen by these observers. This is the, for, the fluid for acceleration, which is orthogonal to the four velocity. 
and you can derive the usual kinematic quantity for this effective fluid. So you take the gradient of the velocity, you project it twice on this three phase and you obtain this tensor VAB, which is decomposed into symmetric and unsymmetric part. And the symmetric part is decomposed further into the shear tensor and an expansion tensor. So this is all stuff and you can find it in the seminal paper by George Ellis in 1971. This is the gradient of the core acceleration is the tensor, special tensor VAB that I told you before, plus this correction here, which uh, um, at the term uh, is proportional to the velocity in the acceleration and, and the velocity takes you outside of the three space seen by these observers. There was an old paper by Tim and Tell in 89 that was actually computing the effective fluid description of this quantity of this um, scalar tensor gravity, but it was not giving the um, kinematic quantities and there was also a sign error. Anyway, these are the quantities. So this is the four acceleration. And I'm um, just showing a lot of expressions, but you don't need to remember any of that. Uh, this is the special tensor VAB, and the vorticity vanishes identically because the scalar this um, fluid comes from a scalar field. So that was to be expected. Again, uh, this is the spatial scalar that we're going to use later. This is the shear tensor that we're also going to use later. Don't need to remember anything out of this except that all these quantities are built out of the scalar field, is gradient and the second covariant derivative. So when you write the field equations in this form, the stress energy tensor, effective stress energy tensor on the right decomposes in the form of an imperfect fluid. So this is the important part. So you have this part here um, that uh, is just including the, the effective density of the fluid. This QA is an effective heat flux density. UB is the for velocity, and this pi AB is the stress tensor, which includes an isotropic pressure plus anisotropic stresses. So if you define in a covariant way these quantities, you can compute them. So this uh, fluid um, effective heat flux density, the stresses and the anisotropic stresses are purely spatial tensors. So when you calculate these quantities explicitly, this is the result. Again, not much to remember. Uh, if you need details when you compute the, these quantities, you will identify all the details. So these are all quantities built out of phi in this derivatives. And this is the anisotropic stress tensor. So one thing I want to stress here is the heat flux density. When you compare the expression that you derive uh, uh, two slides ago for this quantity, sorry, this doesn't work. This quantity here, the heat flux density, uh, sorry, this quantity here, you compare it with the expression for acceleration. In five minutes, it's easy to realize that uh, the, the heat flux density is proportional to the for acceleration. Okay, so uh, what do we make of this? The proportionality is simple. So the, the dissipative nature of the fluid is given by this heat flux density and by this anisotropic stresses here. So the quantity that I want to consider here is uh, this dissipative fluid. So take this, uh, uh, take it seriously. So what do we know about dissipative fluids? Well, these are described in various ways. The simplest way, which is not totally correct, is Eckert's first order thermodynamics. It is non-causal, but it's the first approximation that people use to describe dissipative fluids. We don't need the full theory here. There are some constitutive relations in Eckhart theory in which the viscous pressure, which potentially is there, is proportional to the expansion scalar. The heat flux density is given by generalized Fourier law. So here, if you neglect the second term, you see that you have the usual Fourier law in which the uh, heat flux density is proportional to the spatial gradient uh, of the temperature, K is the thermal conductivity. And then isotropic stresses are proportional to the shear strength, um, shear tensor through the shear viscosity. So the quantities that I want here are uh, these two equations here. So these are just constitutive relations, probably wider validity than uh, Eckhart's theory. So if you compare with the expression that we have for the effective pressure, a uh, heat flux density and anisotropic stresses, you find a relation between the um, temperature and the scalar field. So this would be the, uh, the temperature of scalar tensor gravity. And uh, this comes from the fact that the heat flux density is proportional to the four acceleration. And if you compare with the constitutive relation, essentially you don't have the first term, you have only the second term, and you can read off the product KT, the con thermal conductivity for the temperature. So you get an expression for that. And you get an expression also for the shear viscosity, which turns out to be negative. This is not a terrible drawback because uh, uh, 
you get a negative uh, viscosities in systems that exchange energy with the surroundings. This happens in the atmosphere, ocean currents, liquid crystals, a lot of systems. So what we have here is that the scalar field uh, that gives rise to this uh, effective fluid is actually coupled to the Ricci curvature, so it shouldn't be too worried about this uh, viscosity being negative. So the quantity that I want um, to focus on is this temperature of gravity. So this is the ingredient that was missing in the thermodynamics of space time. There have been over 2000 papers inspired by Jacobson thermodynamics of space time, but the, the, the approach to equilibrium, the GR equilibrium state has never been described. So this gives an approach and a, a way to the, define the temperature. So you see that phi equal constant, which we all know corresponds to general relativity, is actually the state of zero temperature. We don't have an equation of uh, approach to equilibrium coming from existing theory, but uh, just from this uh, differentiating this relation here, you get uh, an equation that describes the approach to equilibrium. This is a posteriori, but you know the solution with the rest equation from it. Okay, it's fairly complicated, but we can consider simplified scenarios. So for example, suppose that the second term is zero, and that can happen, for example, in electrovacuum, if you take a mega wave constant and the uh, zero potential, then the box phi is going to be equal to zero. Then you get uh, that um, the relation, the equation that describes the approach of equilibrium is only this term in the second and the third term on the right-hand side. So this one essentially tells you this, that, uh, DKT is larger, uh, if, if the um, expansion is negative, which means gravity is focusing this fluid, then uh, KT as a derivative that is larger than KT squared. So this means uh, that you're in situations similar to a degree, if you want, uh, in which KT diverges away from the state of equilibrium extremely fast. So you expect uh, that the division of scalar tensile gravity from general relativity will be extreme near space-time singularities when you have theta less than zero and uh, a situation of large focus. So that's the first prediction. This is qualitative at this point, but it's not too bad. You should trust this to a certain extent. Another situation is when you have electrovacuum and theta is, like, is positive, then uh, you could have that uh, in the effective equation here, the second term uh, could dominate. So you can have regimes which the first term or this, this first term or the second term dominate. And in this case, you get a different situation. So KT can approach the Earth. In this case, you can have diffusion to the general, uh, to gen general relativity equilibrium state. So expansion in this case seems to cool gravity. But if KT is larger, the positive term can dominate the right hand side and the situation can be driven away from general relativity. So the lesson is that the approach to the state of equilibrium general relativity is not always to be expected. So we have looked at several analytic solutions of brand theory of scalar tensor gravity to see if we can corroborate these ideas or if we can falsify these ideas. And so far, we find that for some effect solutions, these general uh, lines uh, in this picture which all come from the expression for the temperature of gravity, actually corroborate this idea. So, so far we found solutions that, solutions that uh, obey this kind of um, general ideas. Okay, so uh, we're still working on this and uh, there will be new papers coming out soon. So to summarize, what we did is just rewrite uh, the scalar tensor field equations in, as in the form of effective Einstein equations as have been done many, many times. And then uh, do some, uh, assume something very minimal. So we just assume the constitutive relations that are um, that appear in Eckhart's theory for dissipative fluids. Now uh, we know that Eckhart's theory is non-causal, it has superluminal, um, superluminal propagation, and that's a problem, but that's still the model that is the most basic model that you use for dissipation. So we don't need to assume all of Eckhart's theory, just uh, the constitutive relations, which probably could be assumed in other theories too. And we find that you can have a, an approach to general equilibrium. So we got an expression for the temperature and for the bulk viscosity of these uh, theories of gravity, if you want. There are several open problems. We are just at the beginning and looking at this uh, formalism, this approach. So one open problem is cosmology, because in cosmology, because of special isotropy and homogeneity, you cannot have a special heat flux density, you cannot have an isotropic stresses in prisma of the cosmology. So this is something that we cannot discuss uh, with our approach, because we get a perfect fluid instead of a dissipative fluid. So uh, the dissipation is not there. 
also situations in which the gradient of the scalar field is not time-like, is something that we're not described yet. Probably we can see something, but we have to think about that. We can extend to other arterias of gravity. We're working on lower gravity and dust gravity at the moment, and you get some, some of the same and something different for the most general dust theories. There could be an alternative approach too. So you could say that instead of having temperature, we could trade the temperature with chemical potential, assign zero temperature and zero entropy to the theory of gravity, to this effective fluid, sorry, to this effective scalar tensor fluid, but uh, give it a, a, a chemical potential that is different from zero. This was done for some restricted theories by Bittman and collaborators and, and almost 10 years ago now. So all these uh, should come out in the next month, two months. Uh, so if you're interested in this kind of idea, please stay tuned uh, on archive. And uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria, for your excellent talk. Very interesting, actually. So questions? Peter. Yeah, uh, comments on a couple of questions. Uh, um, very nice talk, uh, Valeria. Um, Comment, uh, didn't um, Mark Madsen derive the kinematics for a general scalar field? He, he did it for the non minimally coupled scalar field. It wasn't the general scalar tensor theory, I think. Was it not? It, okay. No, but uh, basically the idea was there, just uh, there was nothing about the temperature or the effective temperature. So basically he realized that in general for when the scalar field is not minimally coupled, you have an incurved fluid. Uh, that was very clear. Yeah, yeah. And is then that, the, the, the question, uh, could this in any, in any way be used to shed some light on the, the gravitational entropy problem? In general? Uh, good question. Good question. The problem here is that um, you, uh, you have to make some assumptions, some extra assumptions from Ecker's theory to write down an entropy. You can write down the entropy as then, well, you can write down the entropy density of a fluid, right? So you could do that uh, expression to write down the entropy of this effective fluid. Uh, but um, I'm not sure how to trust it because keep in mind that the energy, that the the, the, the entropy is not conserved in this case. It can decrease because uh, this fluid is coupled explicitly to the curvature. So yeah. statements about the entropy are not so clear. It's the same as uh, having a fluid uh, that is coupled to another system, right? Uh, in fluid yeah. dynamics. Uh. So the entropy and of the fluid can decrease. Uh. Right, right. And then I just had another thought. Um, so if one looks at the the class of spherically symmetric models in um, the scalar tensor gravity. One could think of the Schwarzschild solution as being some kind of um, attractor in that phase space of solutions. Uh, it's kind of, it's related to Birkhoff's theorem. I'm just wondering again, whether you could, you could do something similar here, whether, well, whether that result could, could be described in this framework? Was you could, symmetric? but you need to extend what we've done so far, because when you look at the large or a static solution, the gradient of the scalar field is space-like, right? So you are, if you are yeah. willing to accept the fluid that is space-like, which I think you could, because uh, in any case, this heat flux is a space-like vector, so that implies that the propagation is instantaneous. So I think you could accept in that case the fluid, uh, which has a space-like gradient of the scalar field. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, if you do that, uh, then essentially the Neuer theorems tell you that outside of the black hole horizon, you have uh, the state of equilibrium. So the black the Neuer yeah. theorem is that uh, the statement that generally is the state of equilibrium for fairly generic conditions outside of the horizon. Yeah, yeah. But your fluid right. is space yeah. like uh, we actually need to be a bit more precise on, on that kind of fluid. But I think that's yeah. what we down well, for. One, one might want to try, you know, the one plus one plus two um, formulation where you do yes. a further split. Maybe you could formulate it, the equations in that way and then one could deal very easily with strictly symmetric situations. That might be a good idea, actually. We haven't really given much thought yet because of lack of time, but uh, yeah, that might be a, a better formulation of this piece like situation. 
Yeah. Well, maybe we can chat about that sometime. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks. Any other questions to Valerio? A very quick question from my side as usual, which is the physical meaning of the temperature of gravity? I mean, is it, is it possible to measure somehow the consequences of your recipe? No, no, I don't think it's a matter of measurement here. The, well, not unless you start building out some tools to measure gravity, which might be possible. Now, the idea here was uh, that uh, um, General relativity is the state of equilibrium. And when you add the extra degrees of freedom, you excite this extra degree of freedom. So it makes sense that general relativity corresponds to the state in which you switch off this extra degree of freedom to a state of thermal equilibrium. So the idea is just that uh, it's kind of natural in a sense, it's nothing surprising. I start putting extra degrees of freedom, in this case, the scalar degree of freedom. I excite it and then the spirit time is in an excited state. So it makes sense that general relativity would be the state of equilibrium. What you're learning is that it may not be the, the only state of equilibrium, but maybe others. So the meaning is uh, uh, when you, when if this theory relaxes to general relativity, and there has been a lot of literature, for example, in cosmology, about scalar tensor gravity approaching general relativity, general relativity cosmology in the radiation era or in the other years. If that is true, then we can describe the approach of equilibrium. So the temperature is in a sense your order parameter that describes how this approach happens, which is what, complete, what was completely missing in Jacobs from thermodynamics of space time. He advanced the idea of uh, general relativity as some kind of emergent theory in the uh, modified gravity, F over gravity in that case being an exciting state. But uh, nobody has ever been able to find uh, how this approach to equilibrium happens, an order parameter. So here we have an expression for the temperature. To be honest, it's thermal conductivity times temperature, but that's something that's a step forward, I think. So it, it depends on the coupling between the, the, the field and curvature, I think. Otherwise it doesn't work or not. Well, it's a scalar field that is coupling. So phi couples explicitly to, to R. So it depends. Yeah. Uh, actually, this temperature depends only on the phi and this gradient, really. K mm. KT depends only on phi in this gradient. So you can look at that in various solutions, but this is a general expression for the general theory, general class of theory. So it's not just a non-minimally coupled scalar field. It could be Brandt-Dicke or um, generalized scalar tensor theory. It, there is a fairly, there is a similar expression also for uh, on desk gravity. So the, the mm. idea is more general. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Valerio. If no more questions, we can go further with Narayan, Narayan Chatka. Did I pronounce correctly your surname, Narayan? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So from now on, you have 15 minutes if possible. And please, it's your turn. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Orlando, for providing me this opportunity to present our work. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm a graduate student at Kansas State University, and I work with uh, Professor um, Ratra. So recently, we have written a paper on gamma ray rust cosmology, um, and uh, today. Um, I will present some of the some of the results of that paper, and and, and the author of this paper are uh, Naren Kartka, Orlando Luongo, Marco Musino, and and Bharat Ratra. So here is an outline um, of my talk, um, and this is basically a structure of our paper. Uh, first, I will talk about, um, I will give a little bit of um, introduction, and then I will talk about uh, some cosmological models that we use in our research. Uh, then I will, I will talk about the data that we are using to test those models. Um, and then I will uh, present some, um, I will present a methodology that we use in our research. And finally, I will show um, some results and, and, and conclusion. So observational astronomy has established um, 
established that the universe is currently undergoing um, accelerated cosmological expansion. Um, so this can be clear from this one, this picture. So if this arrow represents forward direction of time at certain, um, uh, in, in the past, uh, our universe has uh, had a smaller size and with increasing time, its size increases and the expansion rate is also increasing. So that's why we call it, um, we call that, um, we say that um, our universe is under the accelerated cosmological expansion. And this expansion can be explained um, by using general relativistic uh, cosmological models if we include dark energy on them. And next I will talk about some of the cosmological models that we use in our research. Um, and the first one is lambda CDM model. And this is a very popular model. And, and this, uh, this is a standard model actually. Um, in this model, lambda is a dark energy and CDM is a cold dark matter. An expansion rate of the universe or Hubble parameter can be given by um, this equation here. Um, in, in, in this model, um, and, and here, omega m naught is a matter density parameter, omega k naught is a curvature energy density parameter, omega lambda is a dark energy density parameter, and S naught is Hubble constant. And omega m naught, omega lambda, and S naught are free parameter of this model. Um, and in this model, dark energy is constant. It doesn't change with time, um, but observational data doesn't rule out um, some, some dynamics in the dark energy. So, so we also consider um, dark energy models that, that uh, consider dark energy as a time dependent quantity. Um, and the first uh, such uh, um, time dependent dark energy model is, is XCDM parameterization. And in this model, dark energy is, uh, is a fluid and uh, energy density of the X fluid changes with time, as I said. And the Hubble parameter is given by, in this model, Hubble parameter is given by this equation. So here, omega x is, uh, omega x is a uh, equation of state parameter. Uh, and omega m naught, omega k naught, omega x, and s naught are the free parameters of this model. And the second, um, second um, dark energy model, which considers, um, which considers dark energy as a, as a, um, a time dependent quantity is a high CDM model or a scalar field model. In this model, dark energy is modeled as a scalar field. The energy density of the scalar field changes with time. And Hubble parameter in this model is given by this equation. Um, and uh, the omega phi here is a scalar field uh, energy density parameter. Um, which is basically a dark energy density, uh, dark energy density uh, parameter. So, so omega phi is determined by the scalar field potential energy density V phi. And in our research, um, we assume an inverse power law form for this potential, uh, also called called um, uh, P-line Rathra potential. And this potential is given by this equation here. And and alpha is a positive parameter here. So uh, omega phi, um, we can compute omega phi by solving a dynamical equation of a scalar field and numerically. And, um, and, and in this uh, model, the free parameters are omega m naught, omega k naught, alpha, and h naught. So these are the free parameters and we need to fix the, we need to determine these free parameters by using um, observational data. And uh, and each, in each uh, these models, uh, if we want to consider non-zero, um, if we want to consider uh, flat um, spatial curvature, then we, we need to put uh, omega k naught equals to zero. So in general, we have uh, three pairs of um, uh, cosmological models. So here are the data that we use in our research. The first data is a BA plus SZ. The, the Baron acoustic oscillation measurements and the Hubble parameter data. Um, 
And this data spans the relative range from zero to uh, nearly 2.3. Um, and, and this 2.3 is basically highest of, of the lower relative data. And uh, these BA plus AG data are very trustworthy. So, so that's why we use this data to compare um, compare GRB results, results with, with, uh, with the results obtained from, from this data here. Um, and the second data is um, GRB data. And in this data, peak photon energy and isotropic radiated energy, uh, EIS, so are the measured quantities um, for, the, for, for uh, GRB at, at known red shift. And uh, in total, we have, we have 220 uh, uh, GRB measurements, uh, which spans red shift, uh, red shift uh, uh, is based from 0 0.0331 to 8.2, which is very high, high red shift range. That's why uh, this is the one reason that uh, reason um, we we want to use this data in our in our research. Um, and and we we divide these uh, 220 GRBs into two subgroups. One is um, A1118, which contains uh, 118 GRBs and spans the red shift range from 0 .0, 0 0.33992 to 8.2. And these data are basically from the Wang et al. 2016 and Fanadi Risa et al. 2019. If one wants to look at the detail of these data, um, you can, you can uh, look at uh, these papers. And, and another subgroup is A102 data. And this data spans the recipe range from 0 0.0331 to 6.32. And these data are from the Damien et al. 2017. And basically A220 is the union of these two data set. Um, so we, we uh, analyzed these three sets of data, A1118, A102, and A220. Um, so here, uh, for a GRB, the peak photon energy and isotropic radiated energy of uh, GRB are related through a MRT relation. And the MRT relation is given by this one here, log EISO equals to E plus um, B log EP, where EP is a peak photon energy and EISO is um, isotropic radiated energy. And isotropic radiated energy is calculated by using the um, bolometric fluence, which is S bolo, so if we convert this EISO in terms of S bolo, then our equation will be this here. Um, so, so here we can see the luminosity distance DL, uh, which is a cosmological dependent quantity. So this DL is um, calculated by using this equation here. And you can see this equation depends on, on Hubble parameter. So, so to calculate a luminosity distance, we need um, we need cosmological models. Um, so by using the cosmological models and, and peak photon energy, we can predict uh, bolometric fluence. And also we have um, um, measurements, uh, observational measurements for the um, bolometric fluence. So once we have measured quantities and predicted quantities like we have a measured bolometric fluence and also a predicted bolometric fluence. Um, so we can compare them using likelihood function, um, which is given by this. This is a likelihood function that we use to compare a predicted bolometric fluence and the, and the measured bolometric fluence. Um, here, A observation is the observed bolometric fluence and A theoretical is the predicted value of a bolometric fluence for, for a certain um, Red shift. Here, SI, SI square is given by this um, sigma square observation plus sigma external square. Sigma observation is square. Sigma observation is is um, either in measurements um, or uncertainty in measurements, and sigma external is um, is a um, intrinsic dispersion or or external scatter of of MRT relation. So for the BA plus SG data, we follow the similar process, but sigma external is zero. Uh, sigma external is zero for the, uh, for the BA plus SG. Otherwise, the likelihood function is, is exactly
exactly the same either. Um, so, so then, then we, we maximize this likelihood function by using um, uh, MCMC sampling method implemented in Monty Python and class code. Um, so by maximizing this likelihood function, we determine the best fit values for the free parameters of, of, uh, of cosmological models. And, and, also uh, and also we determine the corresponding uncertainties um, on the free parameters. So, and we did that, we performed that analysis and, uh, and we have some results here. Uh, these results are from Khatka 2021. Um, and, uh, okay. So these are the results. You can, we can, we can see uh, cosmological results as well as the MRT relation parameter results. Um, for these three uh, set of these three set of um, uh, GRB data sets, so if you see if you see the results here, so for A twenty A two twenty data sets, which is a which is a whole GRB data sets, um, and most of the people are using actually two twenty uh, twenty data sets um, basically. So you can see here the value of omega m not is very high, so it's it's greater than 0 0.455, and 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 this is a pretty much inconsistent with most of the uh, of the cosmological data, like like CMB, um, uh, BO plus SG, and and supernovae. Most of the data uh, cosmological like this this re this result is um, mostly inconsistent with with other other well established cosmological data. So so. And here you can see in flat lambda CDM model, um, A1118, 118 data set um, gives a lower limit for the omega m not greater than 0 0.23, which is pretty much consistent with BA plus SZ and also with other, other cosmological data. And in other words, we can say uh, this result for A1118 data set is, um, is consistent with with uh, a standard model uh, or, or flat lambda CD model with uh, omega m not equals to 0 0.3, and and a one or two data set provides the value of matter um, matter density parameter um, greater than 0 0.267, which is also somehow consistent with uh, with other well established cosmological probes, uh, but but this data set provides very high uh, intrinsic dispersion on the MRT relation. So, which is here like 0 0.521. So this intrinsic dispersion is really high. So we, uh, we do not pr uh, prefer A1 or two data uh, to, uh, to use in, in cosmology it's because it has very high intrinsic dispersion. So we cannot trust the cosmological results often from, from A1 or to data. So, so also we can see if you combine A118 and A1 or two data, um, A220 data set provides cosmologically inconsistent result with BO plus SZ and also the sigma external or intrinsic dispersion of the MRT relation is very high here also. And basically, this high value of sigma external for A220 is coming from, from the inclusion of A102 data. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is the results for, these are the results for the flat lambda CDM model. And you can see um, in other models also, uh, uh, we, have, we have obtained a similar kind of result, similar kind of result. Um, so, so these are the results for, from our, our paper. So we can see these results in the plots also. Um, so let's see these results in plot. Um, so here, this is a plot for flat lambda CDM model. And I have plotted all the results like for uh, A, A102 data, A118 data, and A220 data, and also the B, B plus SZ data. So, so here we can see the A118 data set 
is consistent with the BA plus ADZ. It is clearly consistent. And A102 data set is also somehow consistent with, with uh, BA plus ADZ. But when we combine these two data and build a A220 um, data set, it is inconsistent with BA plus ADZ. So, um, so if you try to make a Hubble diagram for A2 to 20, it will uh, clearly uh, be in tension with flat lambda CDM model um, because it, it, it suggests, uh, it favors very high value of omega matter and, 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 and tension between the Hubble diagram of some, uh, some observational data and, and the, and the uh, flat lambda CDM model with omega m not equals to zero is basically comes from the, from the value of omega matter. Uh, so, so you can also see here like sigma external for the A, A102 data is very high. And this is the reason we don't want to use this data um, for the cosmological purpose. Um, and, uh, and this is a similar, similar plot for um, flat exidium model. And we can see similar kind of result here. Um, in this model also, A118 data is consistent with BO plus ADZ. And, uh, and, and the two A220 um, data is um, inconsistent with BO plus ADZ here also. Um, so, and this is, this is the flat phi CDM model um, constant from A102 and A118 and A220 data sets. And in this model also, we can clearly see the A118 data is consistent with BA plus ADZ data and, and um, A102 is also somehow consistent, but, but yeah, here also we can see the sigma external is very high for A102 data set. And, and um, A220 data set is inconsistent with BA plus ADZ. So also you can see in all these plots, uh, all these uh, plots for flat lambda, uh, sorry, flat models, you can see uh, A220 data favors um, decelerating universe and which is, uh, which, which is strongly contradicts the uh, constant obtains from, obtained from, from other, other cosmological data. So, um, so th these are the results that we need to uh, we need to look at carefully. Um, and here, here are conclusions, um, some of the conclusion from our paper. Only the EPIS so correlation one A118 GRB sample is reliable enough to be used to constant cosmological parameter. That means we, we don't prefer to use A102 data set uh, to, to constant cosmological parameter because it has very high ex um, sigma external value. Um, so we cannot uh, cannot believe, uh, we, we cannot um, say that results from A102 data sets are reliable enough. And cosmological constant from uncalibrated, this, these results are from the uncalibrated data. We, th these are the pure GRB data. We haven't done anything with, with this. These are the pure signal. So cosmological constants from uncalibrated A118 uh, sample are quite weak and also consistent with those from better established probes such as BO, ADZ, um, supernovae and, and CMB and isotropy data. And there is another, um, another correlation called combo correlation. And we have uh, used that combo correlation for the GRV data set. But here I haven't presented um, those results, um, but, but Current uncalibrated combo correlation GRB data sets are not reliable enough to be used to constant cosmological parameters. And people can see these, um, this in, in, in the paper. Um, I think uh, I presented my, my presentation here. Okay. So there are some references and yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much Narayan. Uh, for your nice talk. It's, ni it's now time for questions. 
So one of you has questions. Nobody? Well, uh, even though I'm a co-author, I would like to ask you for curiosity, what do you think if we could calibrate the, the correlations? Um, you know, you quoted that they were uncalibrated, but in principle, yeah, one could calibrate. So what do you think? Maybe. Yeah. Um, so Professor Ratra and I, I was was talking about this and what we believe is if we want to calibrate um, the raw data by using other cosmological data, then these two data should be consistent with each other. The first, first thing should be that. Like for example, if we want to calibrate um, GRV data by using ADSI data or the supernovae data, then ADSI data and supernovae data should be consistent with, with the GRV data. That should be the first step uh, we need to check. Um, uh, if we want, to, if the, these data are on, inconsistent with each other and we calibrate um, GRV data by using those data, then I think it will not be reasonable. Um, so, what, so what, what do you mean? What do you mean they, they should be consistent? So like, what do you mean exactly? Data catalogs consistent among them. What do you mean? Like cosmological constraints, like um, the cosmological constants obtained from the from the GRB data, and even if they are very weak, um, the the constant from uh, from the GRB data and and the constant from the from the ADZ data and the supernovae data should consistent with each other should be consistent. So if you take alone mm, such catalogs, you say you should get analogous results. You mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, okay, the, I see. Should be mutually consistent with each other. Yeah. For example, okay. here like uh, the A one one A data provides the uh, cosmological constant that are consistent with ADZ data. So you can, we can, we can uh, calibrate A118 data set by using ADSI data, but we cannot um, um, calibrate um, A220 data set by using ADSI because these, these two data sets are inconsistent with each other. Yeah, we discussed it many times during our private discussions uh, by email about this point, okay. The, the previous one was just a curiosity since I am a theorist, as you know, so. Yeah. And <laughs> It's just to ask. Okay, I think it's now the turn of next speaker. Thank you again, Ryan, for your excellent talk. So the last one of this afternoon, uh, that is Nicola, if I remember well. Yeah, Nicola Marcantonini. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Um, I think Ryan should... Yeah. I said, I said, it's I'll show you the, the screen. Yeah. Okay. Now you can sh you can try to share the screen, Nicola. Yeah. Okay. We see we see the screen more or less. It's very large, at least to me. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Fine. Very good. So. Um, you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, it's your turn. You have 15 minutes if possible, as usual. Thank you. You can start. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who's listening to my talk. I'm Nicola Marcantonini, and I am going to show a model uh, I worked on with Professor Luongo and Dr. Muccino. And it is a model which aims to unify orogenesis with dark matter production. What I mean is that uh, this model uh, treats uh, these two processes uh, in an analogous way as two facets of uh, a same phenomenon, which we are going to discuss in a moment. So, uh, first of all, I am going to show how we model biogenesis. Next, uh, I'm going to derive the equations of motion for uh, the pseudo Goldstone boson that arises from a continuous symmetry breaking. Next, 
uh, we are going to see how uh, the solution of the above equation of motion leads to both baryonic and dark matter particles production. And finally, we're going to show uh, what uh, the model's predictions are. And in particular, we're going to show the most important one, which is the dark matter production. So, first of all, quarks and leptons are described by means of two effective fields, which are Q and L, while the environment is associated with a classical field psi. This is a U1 theory, which does not take into account strong interactions. We are aware that uh, in this way, we are just treating uh, a simplified model. And uh, of course, uh, a, a generalization will be needed in the future. Anyway, the quartic potential for Psi enables a phase transition. The minimum of this potential assumes different values before and after the site of phase transition. As we can see, before, that is for T greater than uh, critical temperature Tc, the minimum is different from zero, while uh, for T less than Tc, the minimum is zero, and the, um, it occurs uh, for uh, Psi equal to Psi naught times uh, a complex exponential. In the Lagrangian, we need the other terms. First of all, since the field Psi is associated with the dynamics of the universe, we assume that it provides a generalized kinetic part of the form tilde hex. Instead, uh, quarks and leptons need a Dirac Lagrangian, as shown. And finally, the interaction between uh, our three fields is modeled uh, as shown by two um, interactions by couples between the derivative of the Psi field, that is between the evolution of the universe and Q and L, respectively. And next, we also need a Yukawa term, that is a triple punctual interaction between the three fields. Some key assumptions of the model are, first, the U1 symmetry, which I already talked about. Next, uh, since uh, uh, leptogenesis happened before pyrogenesis, we assume that leptons are already formed. And since uh, there is no clear physical interpretation for uh, an, um, an, a lepton current, we just set the selection constant G2 associated to uh, the lepton current equal to zero so that uh, they are just switched off. And finally, we assume that the, during reheating, the um, environment is slowly varying so that the contribution from the term the mu C0 is smaller than the others. And so we can assume uh, the mu C0 approximately zero. This is another strong approximation since uh, during reheating, uh, the temperature of the universe varies quite importantly. Anyway, um, we do not expect uh, uh, its contribution to be determinant. And um, this is another point which could be analyzed in a further uh, development. So we talk about uh, asymmetry breaking, in particular, a continuous symmetry breaking. And uh, this uh, phenomenon has two important consequences. First, um, there is the rise of the pseudo Goldstone boson theta, which is assumed to be subject to this potential. We chose this form because the Planck collaboration recently told that uh, this is the one uh, with the, be the best agreement with um, observations. Second, according to Nether theorem, uh, there is also the rise of a baryonic current, J mu. And this current enables a baryogenesis. So, as far as the equation of motion for theta is concerned, the Euler Lagrange equation gives us that, together with the assumption of a cosmological flat FRW background. 
and we find this form uh, whose solution uh, is needed in order to compute the rate of biogenesis and most importantly uh, the rate of dark matter production so to obtain it we need the semi-classical perturbative approach so the fields psi and theta are treated as classical while all the other ones are quantized and uh, um, since the constant h must be small uh, we perform the perturbative expansion with the following approximations. First, theta must be small, it was kept only up to order two. Next, the time t must be small, up to order one. And finally, the contribution due to the Hubble constant h in the equations of motion was supposed to be negligible. Thanks to this approximation, we were able to obtain. Uh, a then harmonic oscillator as our solution. And this solution, if plugged into the, the formula for the average number density of particle antiparticle pairs produced by decay of the theta field itself, it would us to obtain the following results. First, in agreement with uh, results which may be found in literature, baryonic asymmetry is drawn here. Moreover, an important result is the dark matter asymmetry, which is found to be proportional to the square of the initial uh, amplitude of the theta field, um, in contrast with uh, the baryonic asymmetry, which is proportional to the cube of the initial uh, amplitude. So the next step was to consider mass mixing. And this not only uh, lead to the correct predictions, but uh, allowed us to get a better insight of the physics of the problem. Indeed, by analyzing the mass matrix, we considered two different phases for the units for the universe evolution. We noticed that in a first phase, that is uh, um, in a precedent phase during uh, reheating, the mass mixing is given by this mass matrix and uh, the dark matter production is the dominant uh, phenomenon. So that we found a result which is uh, two times uh, the previous one the one without mass mixing. Next, in the second stage, in the asymptotic limit, uh, theta dot uh, uh, approximately zero, the mass matrix becomes as shown. The dark matter production stops, and the baryonic uh, production becomes the dominant uh, phenomenon. So that uh, the baryonic asymmetry is given by this result, which once again is in agreement with uh, um, previous results, which may be found in literature. As far as the end of biogenesis is concerned, an intriguing consequence of the recipe is that we are able to stop it without invoking any ad hoc mechanism. Indeed, by imposing that uh, the baryonic current goes to zero, it was possible to find the value of temperature corresponding to the end of biogenesis, which is this one. And uh, as last, our most important prediction, the dark matter candidate, or better, the mass of the dark matter candidate. When numerically solving the equations for Pr, that is the temperature for the endobiogenesis in Heta, and substituting them into the equation for the dark matter mass in X, we found the constraint for it, which uh, is in agreement with expected mass for Wimpzillas. Wimpzillas are supermassive stable uh, WIMPs that uh, are not thermal relics. So the fact that uh, um, by studying a phenomenon which uh, seems to be um, 
seems not to be linked to dark matter. We actually obtain a constraint for the dark matter mass. It looks very important to me and uh, certainly uh, deserves uh, further uh, developments. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Nicola. Even be, because you finished a, a few minutes before the, the 15 minutes that you had, so that's great in order to finish this first day of 84 parallel session. Uh, is there someone who wants to ask something to Nicola? It seems no. Uh, well, as usual, I would like to ask a question, even if I'm co-author of the paper, but um, the temperature that you quoted is something related to to the heating, so it's it's exactly the temperature of the heating, or it happens uh, before it or after it. I don't know. So, well, um, as I said before, the temperature during heating varies uh, uh, quite importantly. So we cannot say that this is the temperature for for reheating. Instead. We can say that it is the temperature uh, of a certain instant of time uh, in the asymptotic limit, that is uh, near the end of rating when the baryonic current goes to zero and baryogenesis stops. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, You're welcome. If no more other questions, I think it's time to stop here this first day. Thank you again, Nicola, for your excellent talk. Thank um, you. So um, the first day uh, has finished. Uh, thank you all for being part of the 84 parallel session today. I hope to see you again next days, during next days uh, for, for our parallel. And I really hope so. Um, and I hope as well that you enjoyed the first day uh, full of very interesting topics and subjects that we have discussed, the, extending the standard models of particles and cosmology. So um, let's see tomorrow. The, the timeline is present on the website. You still have received the um, passcode for tomorrow for any parallel sessions, obviously. And so thank you again. Have a nice evening, morning, depending on where you are, where you are connected. I don't know exactly. <laughs> so thank you again and see you during next days. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Ciao, Valerio, in Italian. <laughs> Ciao. Bye-bye to everyone. Bye-bye, see you.